It's good to be here too, uh, not only to sail in the fjord, but uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to come here and speak. My task is to talk more about what we can do to prevent self-harming behaviors and suicide in adolescents. And uh, I just wanted to show this probably well-known study. Paul, you are here and there you are. And uh, from Rams and colleagues, a wonderful study on how the natural history of self-harm from adolescence into adulthood develops if you look uh, on a population-derived cohort. And uh, uh, we know that the behavior, this problem, peaks in mid-adolescence. And we also know that, uh, fortunately, uh, a large proportion will stop this behavior when they enter into their late teens and into adulthood. But as you can see, there is a remaining group that will continue to display suicidal and self-harming behavior. So that's one focus here. How can we actually create treatments uh, that will prevent young people from establishing a self-harming behavior as a coping pattern or way of li life that will follow them into adulthood? So my claim is that repetitive self-harming behavior is an acquired <laughs> pattern of regulating emotions or behaviors or interpersonal relationships and coping with stressful situations. This is not something you are born with. This is something you learn from somewhere. And it is a very often starting in adolescence and frequently associated with personality disorder. Either it is a full-blown personality disorder, which is diagnosable in this age, or it is at least some features from personality disorders with problems of re regulating emotions. And the effect of uh, self-harm on negative emotion is often very strong, although of course it is uh, of short duration, uh, but it is immediate and strong and therefore highly addictive. So this is the learning or required part of it, right? And there are also several similarities and overlaps with substance abuse and eating disorders and other problem behaviors that are associated with emotion dysregulation. So how would that look in the model? Well, we know that uh, for every episode of self-harming behavior, it often starts with a triggering negative stressful event. Uh, which in people who are having these problems of regulating emotions will often be leading quickly to a, uh, this triggering event into a negative emotion, particularly with people who are... Can you see this? Oh, it's a little difficult, right? It's, is it fading? Did I press on something? Let me see if I can do... Perhaps you should turn up the... Light on the. Oh, here it comes. I hope it wasn't anything I did. Well, I, I shouldn't touch anything, probably. Uh, in people who are having these problems of regulating emotions, it's also this very strong emotional reactivity. And I would be interested, of course, to to uh, listen to, for example, Abby's uh, ideas of could could these biological. Uh, markers that we could detect in this age group be uh, some of the explanatory biological substrates for this emotional reactivity and vulnerability. It's a little difficult here, right? Because someone coming to a sort of lifetime in a second. What? Someone will be coming along in a second. Okay. Sort of lifetime. I hope you can, <laughs> you can see it. Uh, at least uh, for now, uh, this process will, for people with problems of regulating emotions, often be, we attempt it to be dealt with by inhibiting emotions because you simply don't know what to do with it, right? And that's not a very good idea. So if you try to put a lid on a boiling kettle of water, it boils really even harder and boils over. So this hyperarousal that this uh, trying not to feel anything leads to will often be leading to, to a uh, intolerable situation with intense negative emotion. And additionally, uh, we know that hyperarousal very often this, this, uh, it, it inhibits uh, cognitive functions. 
uh, which we are really depending on when we are trying to solve problems and deal with negative stress. So this state of overwhelming intense negative emotion, uh, if people actually then uh, incidentally or learning from others uh, start using self-harming behaviors, it has a very strong negative, uh, negatively enforcing effect on this behavior. So since self-harm will reduce negative emotion, it becomes a quick uh, learned behavior. And there are of course also several other uh, um, consequences of this, but the whole um, model would be also outlining a few foci for intervention, such as this negative emotion in itself, uh, and also the hyperarousal and the inhibition of emotions and the intense negative emotion before self-harming behaviors. So this would be foci for us for the treatment, for any treatment actually, of this problem of regulating emotion leading to self-harming behavior. But before we can do anything, of course, we need to detect the problem in itself, and that is one of the problems of treating people with self-harming behavior in adolescence, that we are faced with some problems of, one, avoidance, uh, because teenagers who are self-harming are very often feeling very ashamed about it, and they want to hide it, or they feel that they don't want to be uh, prevented from using this coping mechanism because it works. And they might therefore be very reluctant to admit or to allow helpers to attempt to talk to them or even to help them. And we have also the problem of parents who might normalize pathology or they uh, don't realize how bad it is. Or it could even be that gatekeepers and clinicians might uh, normalize the pathology or avoid it or don't really ask about it. We can even have administrative routines in our clinical facilities that will not allow us to detect early enough that self-harm would be a core problem to these kids. So uh, actually in our studies we have been dealing with this, for example here in five outpatient units for child and adolescent mental health in Oslo. We did a, a screening project where we screened uh, nearly a thousand newly referred patients in the age group 12 to 18. Uh, any kid who were newly referred, not only for, for, for self-harm or for any specific problem or for any problem. And we found that if we used a very simple set of questions uh, that were mandatory for clinicians to ask, nearly one out of four of these newly referred kids would have self-harm as a, an important problem, which was far more than any one of us had believed. Many of these kids had been referred for totally different problems, and if it hadn't been for the screening, they would probably, at least not in the beginning, or probably not ever, have been uh, discovered as a case of self-harming behavior. So this is not only a way of Evaluating, but it is also a way of intervening to start detecting at an early stage in the treatment a self-harming behavior. So when we have detected and we know what we want to treat, what are effective treatments uh, of self-harming adolescents? Now I'm not going to go into detail here because that's what Joan Asano is going to talk more about the different uh, different approaches, but. Uh, just a few years ago, if we had talked about RCT-supported treatments for self-harm in adolescents, we would have had to admit that we have none. We didn't have a single study that would prove that we could treat effectively self-harming behavior in adolescents. But now we have a number, which is really encouraging, although, of course, it is still in an early stage. We, we do have at least one treatment I was not supposed to use this for that purpose. That was, uh, so, so we at least have some replications um, of some of the treatments um, and the evidence base is being built. And I was going now to use some of my time to talk more about dialectical behavioral therapy adapted for adolescents, which is one of those treatments that we have uh, 
are, we are emerging into a stage of grade one evidence for the efficacy of this treatment. So uh, what is DBT for those of you who have just heard about it but not learned so much about it? It is a multimodal treatment. It is a third generation, I would say, cognitive behavioral therapy, adding on features from different uh, theories and philosophies, dialectical philosophy, but also Zen philosophy, uh, to try and balance, for example, polarized views and cognitions and behaviors in kids and their families in order to teach them how to deal with problems of regulating behaviors and emotions. So it will entail individual psychotherapy on a weekly basis, multi-family skills training groups, which would mean that families participate in seminars every, every week, typically in the afternoon, a couple of hours, to learn skills on how to deal, for example, with emotion regulation. And we have also telephone coaching where people are coached by their therapist to use the skills they have learned uh, between the sessions in their real daily life. And we also uh, tell our clinicians and therapists to work together in order to not becoming burnt out by working with a pretty hard, uh, uh, hard work and uh, sometimes very challenging work, but actually be staying focused on the treatment at a high level. And this duration of the treatment would be pretty short, only about 16 to 20 weeks. And this adaptation was made by Alec Miller and Jill Rattis um, in the early 20s. And it was uh, then, of course, not put to trial before we did put that to the trial. And uh, um, I just wanted to get back to this model, the foci for the treatment. So where would, for example, the skills come in here? Well, the skills would actually change some of these uh, transitions between the different stages in the process where self-harm is a runaway train and we want to stop it and we want to make people able to stop it themselves under in the beginning of coaching by therapists and then by parents and then by themselves or their peers. So that skills would be key here, but also we would like people to be able more because they have some seat belts and they have something they can do to regulate emotions so they can then allow themselves to feel emotions and experience emotions which are key to living a full life. So what would be, I, I mean I cannot of course go into deeply into the whole treatment but I could give you some uh, examples of what that would be. So we teach kids, right, don't we, that when they are on fire they should stop, drop, and roll. They should actually do some simple things to survive the situation and not make it worse. So what could that mean in this emotion regulation or skills in emotion regulation? That would, for example, mean that you find some way to shut it down, the fire, without using self-harm, overdosing, or substance misuse, and you freeze and you don't make any decisions particularly with, with respect to life and death decisions, and you make contact with other people. So that could, for example, mean to shut it down, the hyperarousal and the to, uh, very strong urge to self-harm. Could, for example, mean that you're using this very uh, effective and very physiologically accurate strategy to use some sort of ice pack or a bowl of ice cold water, or it could be uh, some other things that are covering your eyes and your nose. And then you take a deep breath. And then you keep your breath for, let's say, 20, 30 seconds while you're covering your nose and your eyes, which actually will be uh, very often releasing a vasovagal response. The parasympathetic nervous system will be stimulated and the hyperarousal will go down along with bradycardia, reduced blood pressure, and other physiological changes. Thank you. Uh, so we know that this is a safe procedure for any other people that, uh, the, those who are, have a cardiac arrhythmia, and it is a reducing panic and anger and, and dissociation. This is something we can teach kids, and we do that. 
And this is cheap without side effects, and it's actually something they can do. In Norway, they can, at least during the winter, even step outside and just use snow. But it can be, be done if you have access to uh, at least some running water. This can, can be done anywhere. Also, of course, when to use these strategies, we need to teach kids that they also need to be more mindful. So this is nothing new. This is actually for more than 2,000 years ago, the philosopher emperor uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, said that through not observing what is in the mind of another, a man has seldom been seen to be unhappy. But those who do not observe the movements of their own minds must must of necessity be, un be unhappy. And that's really true. To be able to observe the movements of your mind. That means that you, teach, you should teach your patient how to observe, describe her own emotions, thoughts and behaviors so that you can know what's going on. Not what went on a few minutes ago, but here and now. So that you can actually take action and use some of your skills. So what are the efficacy uh, evidence now for DBTA. Well, one of the papers in this issue of the JCPP is uh, about the efficacy. And we have previously shown that this uh, is an effective treatment for uh, 19 weeks. Uh, if you compare it to enhanced usual care, both on self-harming frequency and also suicidal ideation and depressive symptoms. Now, as I said, this was recently uh, replicated by Elizabeth McCauley and her team. Uh, mind you, uh, they found the same as we did, but they did not find a sustained effect uh, at the one year post randomization. So, of course, the question is this going to be uh, something that is lasting? Is, of course, a very important question. So, that was what we did in this study, where we followed the kids, more than 90% of them participated at the three-year follow-up. And we found, as you can see here, that not only through the treatment, but also at 1.6 years post-randomization and three years post-randomization, there was a, both statistically and clinically very significant difference between the two, two arms uh, that was sustained. Now, for other outcomes, for example, suicidal ideation and depression, uh, we saw that in the six months post-randomization, there was a big difference between the two arms, but over the longer term, these two groups merged. So somewhere in the longer term, the treatment this usual group caught up with the uh, intervention group with DBT. Uh, but but uh, the key message is here is, of course, that, that you had a quicker treatment response in the DBT arm. There was no on average, relapse in any of the groups. Now, we also looked at mechanisms of change. So one of the key findings here was that if you looked at what happened to the level of hopelessness during the treatment trial of 19 weeks only, uh, uh, that was a clear mediator of treatment uh, effect uh, in the long run. So the outcome here, the number of self-harming episodes over the three-year follow-up period was actually mediated through change in hopelessness through the treatment trial period of only 19 weeks. So that seems to be something key to understanding what would be going on in the heads of these kids in the long run that keeps them from self-harming. That seems to be linked to changes. And probably I won't have time to go into details on these different issues, but hope and hopelessness seems to be key to understand how it can be that some kids then stop using self-harm and start using, for example, skills instead of self-harm in order to cope with their daily life stress and negative triggering events. I also wanted to use my few uh, instance uh, before I end this talk to point to the fact that we can never treat our way out of all of the problems of self-harming behavior in the population in adolescence simply because we won't reach them all. And sadly, all of the trials we have mentioned today, and including our trial, nine out of 10 of the participants in these uh, studies are girls. 
Young women and young girls, where are the boys? They are absent from most of those trials. So how to reach them? Then we need to take into consideration population strategies. This is a famous um, slide I think all of you know from Jeffrey Rose, uh, the sick individuals and sick populations. And could we find some interventions that would actually move the whole Gaussian curve of risk to the left? so that less, uh, also the high-risk group would enter into high-risk zones. That would be fantastic. That would be more bang for the buck if we could have interventions that would do that. And one such intervention would be to look at, uh, for example, here in the UK, I think you know all the coal gas story. You know how de detoxification of domestic gas we, you, it made a huge impact on suicide rates in Scotland and England, where uh, we know that here in the UK, firearms is not such a big problem, but in many other countries it is. For example, the US or in Finland, but even in Norway. Actually, one out of three households in Norway has one or more firearms, and that would be of course, something that we would be concerned about. And we have been working along these different lines, many ways, of how you can influence the access to firearms and how they are used and how much young people are endangered by these firearms, such as, for example, you can uh, make these fire cupboards or safes mandatory, and we did. And we also worked with the public down here at the bottom instead of ending up in the trenches, as in the US, I think they have done many times, instead of being combating the National Rifles Association, we have actually worked with our rifles organizations in Norway and have a favorable collaboration. And I just wanted to share this with you, because this is all males. Firearm suicide is not a big problem at all in women in Norway, but it was, an and particularly in young boys, a huge problem. Here you can see the proportion of suicides. 30 years ago, in 1987, was actually more than 60% of all suicides in teenage boys were, were firearm suicides. Now, after all of these things were done, it's gone down to zero. So this is the last year, 2017 is the last year with complete suicide figures in Norway. We didn't have one single case of firearm suicide in teenage boys. And even in the other groups, it has gone down. So this is one message to you, is that this is one way of having a universal intervention on the systems level that can save a lot of young men's lives and young boys' lives that would otherwise be difficult to save. And you would ask, but wouldn't there be a huge substitution with other methods? Well, we did study that. This is a paper we published in 2016. And here is the uh, specific rate for firearm suicide in all age groups. And you can see it went very strongly down, whereas other methods <coughs> did not go very strongly up. There was a slight substitution with hanging, but that was not able to account for all of the, of the reduction in in, in the total suicide rate in firearm suicides. I just wanted to mention this as another aspect of how to approach the huge problem of suicide and suicidal behavior in the young. Thank you very much.